Good evening, and thank you all for coming to the fourth night in our Summer Monday series at EFLUX. Yay! Yay! To give you some background on this series, from July 28th and continuing through August 25th, EFLUX has been hosting a series of live performances on themes loosely based on the archive of the Agency of Unrealized Projects, or AUP, a project initiated by EFLUX and the Serpentine Gallery, devised by Hans Ulrich Obrist, Julieta Aranda, Anton Vodokla, and Julia Peyton Jones. This summer we are celebrating the semi-productive, unproductive and failed. Unlike unrealized architectural projects, which are frequently exhibited and circulated, unrealized artworks tend to remain unnoticed or little known. But perhaps there is another form of artistic agency in the partial expression, the incomplete idea, the projection of a mere intention. The Agency of Unrealized Projects seeks to document and display these works, in this way charting the terrain of a contingent future. Tonight we are presenting This Literally Happened, a night of storytelling, comprising a reading and two performances that rely on impossible, unrealizable half-truths in order to weave a story that is often more truthful than reality, or perhaps they don't. The evening begins with artist Heather Girton, who will read an excerpt from her unpublished novel in progress, not yet titled Cambodia. The evening continues with Sophia Cleary's Female Figure 2, a solo performance that cultivates sensitivity to an emotional body by acknowledging a persistent tension between performer and audience. In this solo, Sophia Cleary will share and misconstrue personal information about herself through the format of a lecture. The content of these lectures extends from musings about her experiences in psychoanalysis to critiques of the work of contemporary artists such as Jordan Wolfson to questions concerning the performer's responsibility to her audience and vice versa. Note how the quality, dynamic and nuance of a voice can both underscore and undermine the words that are uttered. The evening will close with Alison Brainerd, who is waiting to hear back about a grant to which she applied to create a super dance. The ambitious proposal for this super dance can only be realized with the aid of funding, technology and special effects. It is a performance that cannot exist in reality, only on film and in dreams. In this evening's low-tech, high-visibility forum, Alison will present the pre-funded work in progress. Conversation and drinks will follow. I want to thank the artists who are presenting tonight, as well as Union Beer Distributors, who have kindly sponsored our summer series, and the staff of EFLUX for all of your hard work, collaboration, and good humor. Thank you all for coming, and now I'd like to introduce you to Heather Girton. Heather Girton is a painter and writer, and has performed stand-up comedy in New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles. Moving between these media, she addresses human nature's tendency towards self-actualization through various methods. Preparation and rehearsal are followed by the creative act with potential for mistakes and improvisation. Heather turned to comedy and writing in order to stop her journey of self-actualization from becoming too self-involved. She will often practice her stand-up and readings in front of a mirror over and over again in order not to not be alarmed at the sound of her own voice. The most dramatic feat the most dramatic feat that Heather has ever accomplished on stage was her recent heart attack during her early 2014 reading of her 2013 novella, Model Turned Comedian, at Whitechapel Gallery in London. <laughs> Heather slumped to the ground somewhere between chapters two and three and actually died for a few minutes. After the paramedics came and Heather was resuscitated and taken away, the reading was considered over and the audience applauded. There is a great write-up of this reading in Art Forum's summer issue, which can still be found in some stores. The reviewer, Yves Alain Bois, was very impressed and really enjoyed the, quote, absurd interplay of form and content. <laughs> Heather's upcoming solo exhibitions include Brennan and Griffith in New York in September and Proyectos Monclova in Mexico City. Last year, Girton published a novella, Model Turn Comedian, with Publication Studio and Social Mac Practice Publishing. a lot of preparation. Um, thanks for coming. Um, I thought it would be funny if I got up in the reserved sign. It was on my butt. <laughs> but that didn't happen. 
Uh, thanks for thanks to Chloe for asking me to be here. I'm really excited. Um, I haven't been to this new EFLUX location yet. Um, the acronym for EFLUX is Every Lady Uses X's in Their Paintings. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. So this, I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to read you an uh, excerpt of my um, novel in progress. Uh, it's called Not Yet Titled Cambodia. And this excerpt is part of my upcoming exhibition uh, at Brendan and Griffin in s September. So it's kind of, you're getting a preview of this. Um, okay. We are going to find a house today. I said to myself as I remounted my bike, we had rode off without water or helmets into the hot afternoon air with only a local map of the two main roads. One, ro one of the roads looped around and the other eventually led up to the mountain. It was our second trip here. Although we were on a mission, this trip wasn't about discovery. It was about us finding the land and the house that we would try our best to accurately restore into a modest second house. We were to live here for five months out of the year. We were still young and hadn't bought international property before. But we knew we couldn't imagine paying New York taxes again. Plus, the food here is amazing. I still remember our first night sitting and dining table, sitting at the dining table by the pool of our guest house, a luxuriously restored but modest mid-century mansion. We arrived at night and were hungry. We had just driven six hours across Cambodia. The French expatriate that ran the property suggested that since we weren't familiar yet with the area, we could order our food in, and perhaps another night we could walk to the nearby restaurant. There was no one else on the property, so we chose our room and put our bags down on the bed. The house's atrium was an open air, white plaster, rotunda, and faintly reminded me of the Guggenheim. It had a large wooden handrail that followed the twisting staircase up to the second floor balcony. We returned downstairs to the newly designed kitchen, were given menus, and led outside to the pool seating area. We could see the moon and feel the vastness of the ocean beyond the edge of the property and the dense forest around us. We looked at the menu and based our choices on some light researching we had done in the Times. The menu was both in Khmer and English, it was easy to imagine what the food might taste like. I chose a coconut crab stew. When it came out, it had been prepared in the kitchen, prepared in the kitchen and was brought to us in a metal bowl on top of a rudimentary Bunsen burner. The sauce was absolutely astonishing. This cuisine was what we had given up trying to find in New York. We found out later that what we ordered wasn't even the specialty of the region. Granted, I found a few cooked flies in the coconut stew, but I picked them out and kept eating. I couldn't blame the chefs. It was dark outside, and the next morning at the market, we saw hundreds of flies swarming the crabs as the fishermen pulled them out from the brown and rocky coast. They were left in the open air to sell each day. We were lucky to, that we only got two flies in our soup, and how different really does a cooked fly look than a peppercorn? The fly to me was a symbol that we were far away from the overpriced and sterilized restaurants of New York City. That fly was a symbol of hope. We were wading into unknown territory, but I thought it was important to keep forging forward, stumbling through every step. I really felt that I can do anything if I had the internet. My search terms could be as complex and specific as they needed to be. Every night before our trip, I would type in complete sentences into the search engine like, I would like to buy property in a developing country. And what is the best way to move a piano to Cambodia? And now we were actually here and armed with a loose jumble of information. It was all floating around inside my head. The first two or three sentences of articles from USA Today or Forbes magazine mixed in with local daily Cambodian news that I would occasionally read during my research. 
I would hear about a new left-leaning government party or a honeymooning, honeymooning couple who overdosed on heroin in 2009. I usually only read the headlines and filled the rest of the article with my, in my head. The, <laughs> the young couple must have mistaken the heroin for cocaine. And of course, Brazil's housing market is up, but a volatile investment. I was also looking for furniture. I could spend all day looking for a tile. I wouldn't usually find what I was looking for, unless I did. But even... <laughs> But even then, I wouldn't purchase it. I would print it out. I would print out an image of it and tape it up over my desk so I wouldn't forget. Samples of application forms and pictures of vacuums and washing machines. These acted not only as a constant reminder of what I needed to buy, but also as a constant reminder of my ridiculous organizational system of taping pieces of paper to the wall above my computer. I needed to change my life. A year after starting my research, things were beginning to really change. We were out in the hot sun, nothing holding us down, not even sunblock. Riding around and looking at a full color map with greasy pen marks indicating ancient properties that our friend at the villa had circled for us. We rode our bikes past, a large con past the large concrete structures. They were gray, windowless, and decomposing. The properties that were left standing had been there decaying for 40 years after the war. After riding around during the day and becoming more familiar with the village, we decided to walk into town at night. We were assured that our walk would be absolutely safe. We had a small flashlight with us and we walked along the side of the road. We were able to see about 10 feet in front of us. Except for the small LED circle of light, it was completely blackout. We hugged the side of the road, terrified of leaving the path. We had two irrational fears, landmines and ghosts. The density of the trees along the road blocked out any light that could have come from the moon reflecting off the water. We walked in darkness, looking at our feet until we felt a clearing opening up to the right side of us and we could finally see the stars. That was the first time we were confronted with a massive concrete villa tucked away a half mile from where we were staying. I lifted the pen light up from the road to the property. The light passed completely through the gaping black holes of the front windows to the other side where it hit the trees. I moved the light around the facade. The building was such a skeleton we could see into each of the large empty rooms, the light reflecting off the back walls of the house. I traced each room of the floor slowly at first, but feeling a rush of fear, I sped up my hand movement so the flashlight became a flickering strobe. I stopped, clicked off the light, and was breathing heavily in the shadows. I was suddenly reminded of our mid-century modern architecture tour in Palm Springs. We chose to go with the self-guided tour as we prided ourselves on having a basic knowledge of architecture. I wasn't an architecture scholar, no, but I had gone to, school, gone to a school that was designed by Paul Rudolph, and I was a big fan of design within reach. <laughs> in Palm Springs, we spent most of the day in the car winding around small streets looking at little numbers, then trying to match the numbers to the descriptions on the back of the pamphlet. It was a fun game to guess which properties were actually notable addresses and which were reproductions. When given a vague description and a questionable location, we would say, I see how this is definitely modern. See how low the ceilings are? Of course, it looks very different than the house next to it, only to realize that the house was in fact not mid-century, it was the house next to it. <laughs> in Cambodia, we were looking for our own authentic modern house in the international style that was popularized by Le Cabousier, albeit one that would be crumbling and strewn with bullet holes and graffiti but we promised ourselves that we would make it into the house that it once was in all its glory. We would be absolutely historically accurate, accurate in our restorations, but wouldn't, be against, <laughs> but wouldn't be against updating some things here and there. I needed to get out of everything and find my own place in the world. Of course, we would need certain amenities like air conditioning and a pool, but it really would be starting over where everything was new and outside of us and beautiful. 
A few days into our trip, we decided to venture away from the village center and ride further along the beach. We followed the map and noticed that there were a few places marked coming up. One was a small house that was set above the paved road. Across the road was the ocean. I got off my bike. Cal, who was riding ahead, of, was already off his bike and pulling into the dirt and trees. Just then, we heard a rustling in the woods and looked towards where it was coming from. A small monkey jumped and tumbled out of the trees onto the stone wall next to the road. I thought it was cute, but had read stories of how monkeys attack people's faces. So I stood guarded. Four more monkeys crawled out behind this one. Cal, always thinking that I'm overreacting, told me not to be so worried and, they looked, and then they looked young. Just as he was telling me not to worry, a larger, older male exited the woods. I got on my bike and began to ride slowly in the other direction, but the small monkeys kept following me. I rode faster until they were out of sight and pulled into the tangle yard of the next property. I looked behind me to see that I was not still being followed. Then I looked up and saw the house that I would eventually become ours. Thank you. Next we have Sophia Cleary. Born into the Gothic subculture's first and oldest intentional community in the US, Gothtown, situated near New Brunswick, New Jersey, Cleary's interest in performance was galvanized by a trip to Jersey City to see Cirque du Soleil's Sultan Banco when she was just 12 years old. After appearing in many high school productions and hosting her own YouTube video blog from 2001 to the present, Cleary was accepted to Gerrit Rietveld Academy in Amsterdam in 2009 to study video and performance. From there, she attended Marlborough College in Vermont before completing her master's in performance studies at NYU Tisch in 2011. Sophia is a founder and coordinator of the Works in Progress series Rehearsal and is co-editor of Ugly Duckling Press, Press's performances, performance annual publication, Emergency Index. She has worked with Neil Medlin, Anne Liv Young, Dynasty Handbag, Bob Flanagan, Vanessa Anspor, Marina Abramovich and Ole, Joseph Boys, Andrea Fraser, Alexandra Buxetzis, Divine, James Lee Byers, Shirley Temple, and the Kate Bush Dance Group. Troop. Additionally, Sophia has presented her work at various New York venues, including the Center for Performance Re Research, Dance Space Project, and Dixon Place. Sophia's latest project is playing drums in penis, a feminist punk band co-founded with Samara Davis. Just a quick turnover for like a second. Do you ever just feel like getting up in front of an audience? Okay. Sometimes I feel like performing isn't enough. <laughs> that was me being very real. Um, so this piece is uh, a solo performance that I was inspired to do out of fear of the solo. And uh, I, I was gonna initially like make a dance because that's what I do. But, um, like, why? Why would you make a dance? Or I don't understand. So 
I thought I would just, because like what I really want to do is relate to people. Hey. I want to like, like make a real connection um, or engage with people in a meaningful way. And I'm serious. <laughs> but you think I'm not because I'm like on a stage at Eflux or whatever. I'm not on a stage. Okay. Uh, so I thought by whatever, exploring this area of vulnerability in performing, that I would start by presenting like a two slide PowerPoint about um, about me and it'll be like images and a story. What I think is like really romantic and cool about this is that it'll be images of interiors, which is like a feminist thing to explain to you. Uh, okay, yeah, so, okay, so the first image is obviously my loft. And this is where I live. And it's where I spend a lot of time rehearsing and thinking about my work. Uh, it is here where I contemplate what kind of work I make. And I've been thinking recently, like, what would the genre be if you were to make a genre for my work, or put my work in a genre? And I think it would be called accessible confusion. Because it's confusing, because I'm obviously very confused. And it's accessible, because I'm right here. So that being said, an important part of this process is, um, oh, I hate that I say um so much. That's such like a comedian thing. Um, uh, whatever, OK. What I want to not do in this performance is to like wear the social Sophia mask, which I'm really good at doing. You know, like, I'm gonna charm you or whatever. I fucking hate that shit. And I feel oppressed by it socially. And oftentimes I am so exhausted after being around people because I literally have just been performing the entire time. So I was thinking, right, that I would use the performance as a chance, the solo performance as a chance to finally not perform, if that makes any sense, and to like, whatever, try to be just me, authentic me. So with that, you know, I see some friends here. And I hope that if you see me slipping into that mask, the Sophia masks, that you could just shout out, you know, no, as I slip into it. That would be useful for me as an exercise. I just did it. No. Okay, thank you. <laughs> of course, the conundrum is that I am in front of you, whatever, I'm performing. So it's very confusing, but it's just an exercise for me. So that's what we're thinking about right now. OK, so as I mentioned, I have problems with masks, social masks. And you know that's why I got into therapy, because I went to the TRCC. Anybody ever been there? Theodore Reich Center? Thank you. Love you. Um, and I said to Lois, the woman who does the intakes, that I can't tell when I'm performing or not. And she said that you've come to the right place. 
And um, so, yeah, so this is an image of my therapist's ceiling where I spend a lot of time. I lay down, you know, I'm one of those. And yeah, one, two, three. Come on in. Talking about therapy. Um, therapy is a part of my practice. And something I have to say about that, I, I feel like there's this thing in the art world, or maybe not just the art world, but there's this thing that's like therapy is obviously not cool content, first of all. Secondly, when you treat performance or some sort of form of your art as therapeutic, people kind of look down on it. You know, like you have your friend who says, um, I, really, I like that show, but I think she's using it as therapy. God forbid, like, you or the artist or an audience member transforms through the work, right? God forbid. What is your problem? Get over it. So I'm talking about therapy, and um, I wanted to record a session that I had with my therapist and of course, I ask permission because I'm deeply obedient. <laughs> Fucking, like, bottom. And I was like, can I record this session? And he was like, no. And so I didn't even do it illegally because I'm still scared. But anyway, I figured that I would just work out whatever it is that I wanted to defer onto that recording live which I think I've done so far tonight. I'm getting there. Uh, so, so right. So performing is like, uh, it's like the ultimate power bottoming because I'm like in a position of power in which you feel whatever held hostage in this situation. But honestly, I'm held hostage. And I'm going to be the one later for many hours thinking about how it went, freaking out, and who laughed at what thing? Do my friends still like me? Uh, does, did they pronounce my name right? Will they, whatever classic sort of boring narcissist stuff. Uh, and as I researched in a lecture I did a couple years ago, anybody know that guy Leo Bersani? He talks about like bottoming as an urge to self-destruct, which I think is kind of like what performing is. <laughs> So I'm at your mercy, right? Which brings me, uh, you know, to the topic of sadism and my show at David's Werner. I don't know if you saw it. This is me. And I did a dance there. I was commissioned $500,000 to dance. <laughs> and uh, there was a video made that, I mean, it wasn't made, it was like, whatever, someone from Performa took a picture, a video illegally. And there, so that video, I was very proud of it. And... Um, that video was circulating. I felt good about it. It was a video of me dancing. And uh, I was dating this guy at the time. You know, I showed him the video. And 
you know, because this is obviously a feminist work, I was very concerned about how my lover at the time would perceive it. So, you know, when he watched it, he was, you know, his eyes were kind of glazed over and he looked up at me once it ended and he said, can I get a copy? And I said, no. Anyway, I have like a video of that dance somewhere in here. Um, or, I mean, I could recreate the dance as well if you would prefer. Okay. So I'm going to do that. Just... Okay. Uh, okay, thank you. Oh, sorry, that is just not at the right time. Okay. So we're just going to uh, play that, and I'll put an image up just to get you really in the mood. Uh, you want that one or this one? You want the therapist ceiling or the me? Therapy? Okay. Is it loud enough? Okay.
How's everybody doing? Yeah. Cheer louder. <laughs> Finally, we have Alison Brainerd. Alison is an artist living the dream in New York City. Three quarters Irish, one eighth Italian, and one eighth unicorn. Alison hails from Boston, Massachusetts, birthplace of the American Revolution, the Red Sox, and new kids on the block. Following in the footsteps of fellow Bostonian Natalie Portman, Alison has pursued a career in performance as humorous, as humorous as it is rigorous. Her work blurs the boundaries of experimental dance, theater, and performance, and she always has a sense of humor. Some of her more daring and humoring, humorous performance feats include making out with a mirror while balancing on the chest of a European gigolo, speed dating while submerged in a bathtub of conversation hearts, all printed with the phrase LOL and French kissing every third person in line to vote for her favorite Brooklyn City Councilman, Darlene Mealy, at the 2013 City Council elections. In the past, Allison has worked and collaborated with Marina Abramovich, Ryan McNamara, Patty Chang, Martha Rosler, Lauren Conrad, Dolly Parton, Terence Coe, the fabulous Wonder Twins, Susan Sarandon, and Carolee Schneeman. She has performed in many venues in Manhattan and Brooklyn, including Abrams Art Center, Judson Church, and the Bruce High Quality Foundation University, or BHQ of you. Hey guys. Um, we're gonna have to move this chair too. Uh, thanks, Chloe. How's everyone doing tonight? Is everyone doing good on this summer Monday? Yeah. Wow. I'm so excited to be here. Um, but I have to, yeah, I, well, first I want to thank Chloe for putting this all together. Let's give a big round of applause for Chloe. And um, this is actually the first time, this is the first time I've ever been to EFLUX, and it's really cool here. So thanks for having me, EFLUX. You don't have to clap again. Um, <laughs> but I have to be honest, um, I was going to do something really different tonight, or different than what I'm going to do. Um, but something happened and it really made me want to try the piece that I'm doing for you tonight. And so I just want you to keep that in mind, um, that the thing that happened to me happened on Thursday. Um, so I only had like four days to do this. Um, because just, I had to turn it around, you know. So I just wanted to ask, are there any artists here tonight? <laughs> Can I get a show of hands for how many artists there are? Okay. That's like, I'm sure there's more than that. <laughs> um, but uh, I, um, I asked because I know that artists have to apply for a lot of things. Like, I'm an artist, and I'm always applying for residencies and grants and things, and you never really get them. I never get them when I apply for them, um, and it makes me kind of sad, but it's also a good thing to do because, you know, you can generate an idea, you know, you, maybe something you wouldn't even thought of if you hadn't been like, hey, 
here's this opportunity. You should come up with an idea for it. So that's good. But like, when you're always just getting shut down, it can be kind of depressing. Um, so it's kind of like, why bother? But um, so, you know, I don't know. I Right now, I've been making a lot of work that's really like, adapted to the situation I'm in. So if I have, like, these five people can be in my piece. Cool. Like, this is the space we're going to perform in. OK, it's this big. Um, and this is the theme of the show. OK, now I'm going to make a piece for it. You know, it's not like, oh, I, I have this great idea. I'm going to do this thing. And it, I need, like, 50 dinosaurs for it. And I need it, it needs to be in a huge soccer field. Like, I don't really work like that right now. So sometimes it's really nice. You get it, like, you apply for something, you can, like, come, you can think big, dream big, you know? I mean, like, lately, I've been performing, like, anywhere. I'll basically perform in, like, all of these really shitty, like, Bushwick spaces. Like, to be honest, this is not the first time that someone has peed on stage before me. Like, before I have to go on, like, sometimes, like, more than, you know, and, like, more than once, people come on and they're just, like, they're just, like, mm, and they dump broken glass on the stage. Like, one time that happened right before I was about to be, like, completely naked on stage, and I was just, like, I guess I'm wearing shoes tonight. So, you know, it's great to, like, get exposure, get practice, you know, practice being, okay, well, I'm wearing shoes, or like, oh, there's some pee, you know? So it's, it's really good skill for me as a performer to work like that, but sometimes I just wish I could make like a huge, amazing thing, you know? So recently I got this email um, from this group called Aunts, and I love them. They were recently asked by the New Museum to to put together a project where there would be a production residency in the New Museum Theater for one week. And um, they were sending out this email to the people they had worked with in the past to come up with an idea for a piece that involved dance for camera, right? So I was like, oh, cool, I have a great idea. I'm really inspired by big budget dance films, right? So like, Dirty Dancing, Grease is one of my favorites, um, Footloose, Flash Dance is a big inspiration. Um, West Side Story, you know, Strictly Ballroom, things like that. And the cool thing about those films is like, or any dance film, basically any film, you can create a reality that doesn't, ex in film, you create your reality, right? You can, you know, it's not just a person witnessing life, it's multiple cameras, edits, you know, you can take time away to create this thing that's unreal. Um, so, and one of the cool things about dance films is that, you know, for instance, in the final scene of Flashdance, or in, in the entire film of Flashdance, there was a body double the whole time. The actress was only featured in, like, the, the face shots, right? So she had a body double for all of her dancing, and in the final scene, there were two additional body doubles, so four performers total. There was one body double that was a gymnast that did, like, a huge leap through the air. And then there was another body double that was actually a man that did a break dancing move. They didn't even put a wig on him. You, if you watch it, you'll see, he just has like kind of curly hair. And, um, and he totally looks like a man, if you look. Anyway, but you know, you're watching this movie, you're suspending your disbelief, you don't see it. So my idea for this, resi this production residency was to put together a super dance. Okay, one that I could never do and no one person could ever do, but it would look kind of like just one person was doing it. So I would use a bunch of different body doubles. I would hire professional dancers, maybe even like acrobats. I don't know. I hadn't gotten that far. Um, but they were all, some of them would look a lot like me. Everyone would be dressed the same, you know? Some of them would be like a little taller, a little short. Sometimes, you know, progressively you'd be like, okay, what's going on here when I edited? the film. So I came up with this proposal. It was really good. I like worked on it. I was even on vacation while I was working on it. And I asked all my friends to help me and I like paid 10 euro for internet one day. Um, I was like staying on a commune, like a hippie, like utopian artist commune in Germany. Um, and I had to pay for the Wi-Fi in the village. 
to finish this up. Um, and I was like, sent it away, and I was like, great, this is a great idea. And then a, a little bit while later, they were like, hey, we really like your project. Come in for an interview. And I was like, sweet. And I came in, and I honestly nailed it. Like, I nailed the interview. I presented the idea, like, super well. And I don't know, I was confident. I'm just so clear about what this idea is in my head and what I want and how I'm going to do it. And um, I felt really good after that. And then, like a week later, I got an email that said that I didn't get it. And I was really, I mean, I totally, you know, I, I always think, oh, I'm applying for this thing, I, I, I won't get it. I always prepare myself. But this time, I didn't prepare myself very much at all. So I was really sad. Um, you know, because you, like, you work so hard on this idea, and you, like, convinced yourself about it. And then, um, you know, you don't get it. So I'm, I'm feeling, I'm, like, in a better place right now. But, um, like, the night that I found out, which was Thursday night, I went in to rehearse for, like, what I was going to do tonight. And I just, um, I watched the final scene of Flashdance on YouTube. And um, so I made this short film of me watching the, the final scene. Um, it's really low budget, because I don't have any funding. That's the other thing I forgot to mention. This production residency was going to have like a budget. And I never have that. I mean, so um, this is really low tech. You can't really tell, but maybe if you look kind of closely, like, like a single tear rolls down my cheek on this side. And like my nose was running, but you definitely can't see that. Um, just imagine like what it feels like to have a runny nose, I guess, and be like crying. Like, like the tears are like there, but they don't all come, you know? So um, I, we're gonna watch this first and then I'm gonna do the piece. So I'm just gonna turn the lights off here and get off, get off stage.
Thanks for watching that. Um. So yeah, I was. That's not fake. That's real. How I really felt. Um, and but I feel a lot better because um, I decided that you know I'm gonna do it he here tonight. Um, <laughs> The, so, you know, it's live. So it was going to be a video, but it's going to be live. So, there, uh, yeah, come on. Come on, sit down. This, honestly, also, I'm really sorry, but, like, the seats back there are not going to be super good. So if you want to stand up at any point, do it. Um, because there's some stuff that happens on the ground. Um, but, yeah, so there's no cameras. I mean, there's, there's documentation, which is so nice. But there's, there's no um, editing, no cameras. So whenever you see me, um, I just ask that you try to really zoom in to, like, like right here. Um, don't look at my body. Because it's going to, if, because it, you would have just seen my, like, the face shot. Um, but when you see my body doubles, um, you can zoom out and you can look at everything. Um, you know, so there's that. Let me see, I think I had a few more things, like other disclaimers I wanted to. Um, well, yeah, so in this version, Flashdance is like the heavy influence, but in the, in the film version, it was gonna be like, not necessarily Flashdance, but you know, I only had like four days, so I was just like, okay, let's go with Flashdance. Um, and, you know, oh, if you see any transitions that are a little weird, just, like, don't look. Because I would have edited those out if I had the camera. So you're really going to have to help me, like, suspend your disbelief, okay? Um, and then, yeah, just keep in mind, like, we had a pretty limited budget for this. Um, it mostly went to costumes. Um, so, yeah, it's, like, it's not, it's, it's not... It's not what I wanted the project to be, but it's a start, and I got to share my idea with you. And, um, you know, it just would make me, like, even more sad than that if I just had this idea sitting in my head all the time and no one to see it. So um, we're going to get started in a little bit. I'm just going to do some stretching really quick, and, um, yeah, then we're going to start. So let me just warm up.
thanks everyone for coming. Next week we have Fail, Fail Better at 7.30. So back here Monday, 7.30 for the last of the events in our series. And there's beer, so drink it and chat and hang out. Thank you. Thank you.